It quickly became clear that Luke Harlow was not who he betrayed himself to be. On Twitter, the adult man talked of himself as an amateur filmmaker and described himself as a quote, professional serial killer. He also tweeted his plans to shoot a slasher movie called The Harvest, with the tagline, this Halloween, everyone dies. This is Red Rum, stories about the true victims of crime. Kaylee Haywood. 15-year-old Kaylee got into her dad Martin's car early one evening in November 2015. He dropped her off at Ibstock Community College as planned and said goodbye. He wouldn't be seeing her later on tonight as she was staying with a friend in Ibstock Town, not too far from her own home. Martin noticed that Kaylee seemed in good spirits when she got out of the car. She was her normal, happy self, most likely because it was Friday, which meant she had the whole weekend ahead of her with no school. The rest of the evening carried on as normal, at least from Martin's point of view. He and Kaylee's mum Stephanie continued with the night, not worrying about Kaylee. It was quite normal not to hear from her if she was out with her friends. But the next day soon came and there was still no word from Kaylee. Again, this wasn't too worrying. Perhaps she just decided to stay with her friend a little longer. Stephanie had a bad feeling and asked Kyle, Kaylee's older brother, if he'd heard from her. He hadn't. And then, after trying to get in contact with Kaylee a number of times and getting no response by text or answering her phone, Stephanie decided to contact Kaylee's friend who she was staying with. At least that way she could find out what they were up to and when she would be home. And that's when the devastating reality hit. Kaylee's friend revealed that she hadn't been with her that day or the previous night as she'd told her parents. In fact, she had no idea where Kaylee was. Stephanie and Martin immediately called police and reported Kaylee as missing. At first, officers wondered if she'd gone missing by choice. They needed to look into whether she'd had an argument with anyone, or maybe she was being bullied and wanted to get away. Given Martin's account of the last time he'd seen his daughter, and some investigation into her last known whereabouts, it quickly became clear that there was nothing out of the ordinary and no reason as to why she would have just gone off on her own. Stephanie knew her daughter, and she knew she wouldn't do that especially as the hours passed by and turned into Sunday and then Monday. Kaylee knew her parents would worry. She wouldn't let them be in this much pain and distress. She would just call. Soon after that, Kaylee's smashed mobile phone was found by a member of the public on a path nearby Sense Village Park in Ibstock. By the afternoon of Monday the 16th of November, police were taking Kaylee's disappearance seriously and had stepped up their search area. They sent officers door to door, as well as shutting off roads and areas of woodland so that they could search more thoroughly. Later on that day, a canine unit was brought in and a drone search was launched. The people in the town of Ibstock were becoming increasingly worried that this wasn't a one-off and families in the nearby area were voicing their concerns that something could happen to their children. Police needed to find Kaylee quickly. A statement released by police said, quote, We have a number of active lines of inquiry, but we would urge the public to continue calling the dedicated incident room if they have any information which could assist us. Were you in the Dyesworth or Belton area between Saturday afternoon and Monday morning? Did you see anyone or any vehicles acting suspiciously? The town of Ibstock completely transformed overnight as the media got hold of the news of Kaylee's disappearance. Satellite vans lined the streets, waiting outside of Kaylee's home, trying to get word on where Kaylee was and what had happened. That was when the police turned to her social media. Stephanie saw Kaylee on Facebook all of the time, and the police thought there might be some information on there as to where she might be. Stephanie was able to quickly access her daughter's Facebook account and handed the details over to the police. She had been speaking on there to someone she'd never met, but had formed some kind of a connection with. The person in question actually turned out to be a man who had been grooming Kaylee. Although this may have been a solid line of inquiry to look into, the police quickly ruled this man out as they found something far more damning when they trawled through another set of Kaylee's Facebook messages. They found that just two weeks before she went missing, 
She connected with a person who used the name Luke Fun Times Harlow on Facebook. She'd accepted his friend request and the two had started talking. Initially, she said hi and asked who he was. Those first messages on Facebook came through from Luke on Halloween, the 31st of October, 2015. Things progressed quickly and after asking where she was from, Luke gave Kaylee his phone number. After that, Luke goes on to call her babe, then asked if she had a boyfriend. Kaylee said she didn't and Luke goes on to say that she was too pretty to not have a boyfriend and then he called her his princess. The messages continued. 2,643 messages were found to be sent between the two of them and at some point within those two weeks, prior to Kaylee's disappearance, Luke messaged her saying that they should meet up. He said that they should have a party at his house with alcohol. He said that they'd get drunk on vodka and they arranged to meet on that Friday, the same Friday that Kaylee went missing. He had then persuaded Kaylee to lie to her parents and pretend she was staying at a friend's house rather than his. It quickly became clear that Luke Harlow was not who he portrayed himself to be. On Twitter, the adult man talked of himself as an amateur filmmaker and described himself as a quote professional serial killer. He also tweeted his plans to shoot a slasher movie called The Harvest with the tagline, This Halloween, Everyone Dies. Luke had a house in Ibstock, which meant he was not a child like Kaylee. It became clear that Luke had been grooming Kaylee for a few weeks with the sole intent of getting her to come to his house. Luke admitted that Kaylee had stayed at his house on both the Friday and Saturday night. He said that afterwards she'd left his house and he hadn't seen her since. When asked how old he was, Luke said 27 and went on to admit that he knew Kaylee was just 15. How old are you? 27. How old is she? Yeah, well, I obviously feel bad, don't I? Why do you feel bad? Because she's too young. For what? For coming and staying my mind for starting up. And what else? None other stuff. What's the other stuff? Um. What did you get up to? I did some stuff. And how did you? become friends on Facebook. How did that come about? Um, um, I can't, I can't remember if I added her or she added me. I'm not 100% sure. Oh, right. But like, I've got loads of people on it and I have a habit of accepting anyone who tries, you know what I mean, regardless of whether the name rings a bell or anything. I've got like 2,000 of people on it. But I'm not sure whether she added me or I added her, but basically as soon as we were friends on it, we just started talking, just like, you know, like, oh, hey, how are you? And then, like, where are you from? Blah, how blah, long blah. ago was that? Not long ago, only about, I'd say, roughly a month. Right, a month. OK, going back to her no, description, that's fine. They couldn't, that's fine. You know what I mean? He said that on Saturday night, he'd run out of alcohol and wanted to keep on drinking. He left his house and went round to his neighbour's house to get some more. His neighbour, Stephen Beadman, didn't have any alcohol, so they both went to the nearest off-licence to get some. Instead of returning to his own home, Stephen went with Luke and went back to his house to join him and Kaylee in drinking. Luke then said that he headed up to bed around midnight as he felt very drunk, and in doing so, left Kaylee downstairs with Stephen. The next thing he remembers is waking up in the late morning and going downstairs to find his house was empty. Both Stephen and Kaylee were gone. After conducting door-to-door -door inquiries, police discovered that on that Saturday night at around 10pm, the neighbours heard banging and crashing but couldn't place exactly where it was coming from or what it could be. Later on, in the early hours of the morning, a resident on the Sense Valley Park side of the neighbourhood looked out of his window to find a man wearing a dark jacket with a band on and for that reason he initially thought it was a police officer arresting or restraining someone. He realised quickly that it wasn't a police officer at all, but was a man with a younger woman. He then saw both of them walk off together and because they appeared to be arm in arm, he assumed it was a couple who had had an argument and so didn't alert anyone. 
Luke's house was searched and officers were suspicious of the state of his house. It was clear to them that there had been some kind of physical altercation. There were things out of place, seemingly having been knocked over, but there was no sign of Kaylee. Police then went to speak to Stephen Biedman, but he wasn't at home. They thought he could be on the run and could potentially have Kaylee with him. It wasn't long before they honed in on an address nearby that belonged to one of Stephen's family members. They swarmed the property and found Stephen inside. He was arrested and officers noticed that he had extremely obvious wounds on his face, almost as though he'd been in some kind of very physical fight. The wounds were very fresh and threw more suspicion on Stephen and even more concern for Kaylee, especially when the officers found no sign of her in the house. Stephen told officers that he'd got the injuries when he was working at a farm about an hour away in Belton. For the purpose of really urgency, Stephen, I'm being quite honest with you, we don't know where Kaylee is. We don't know if she's injured somewhere. We don't know if she's not alive, if she is alive. And we urgently need to find Kaylee Haywood. So before we get into all the detail of how you know her and where you were and all of that, we want to give you an opportunity, if you know her, if, and if you indeed know where she is, to tell us right now at the beginning of the day. No, I don't. You don't know where I she don't is? I don't know where she is. I met her Saturday night at eight, about half seven, eight o'clock. Lay down four hours. When she was that drunk, she couldn't even. I couldn't get much conversation out of her. She'd been with Luke on Friday. She stayed around there Friday, apparently. Saturday. He knocked on my door. I got a bottle of pop. I said, No, why? Because I've got a bird round. I've had around since Friday. Stephen Biedman was a 28-year-old landscape gardener who was well thought of and worked often in his local town. People knew him, and generally he was well liked. It was shocking to his neighbours, and people who knew him, that he might be involved in Kaylee's disappearance. When officers asked where Kaylee was, Stephen denied knowing anything. He said that on the Saturday in question he'd gone to the local co-op shop and had a pretty normal day. He did soon admit to meeting Kaylee on that Saturday night, as Luke had previously said, but he said he'd only been there for about four hours. He then went on to contradict Luke's account of what had happened. He said that at around midnight, it was he who left the lounge area and went home without Kaylee. He said he left Luke and Kaylee together on the sofa. He reiterated that he hadn't seen or heard from her since then. He added that he didn't remember some specifics from those four hours because he'd been drunk, but he knew he left at around midnight. Stephen's home was searched pretty immediately after the interview, but Kaylee wasn't there, and there weren't any obvious signs that she'd been there at all. Officers continued searching and found evidence that Stephen rented a lockup unit nearby. They made their way over to it, but again, there was no sign of Kaylee inside. However, Just outside the unit, there was a large skip-like bin that investigators continued looking through, and what they found inside was very telling. There was a bag and top that Stephanie identified as belonging to her daughter. She also went on to confirm that a bra found on a bush-lined path not too far from Stephen and Luke's houses was Kaylee's. They also confiscated a pair of Stephen's jeans that had a bloodstain on them. That blood was later found to match DNA from both Stephen and Kaylee. The investigating team obviously didn't believe Stephen's story about his injuries, but they did need to check out the farm he'd spoken about, just in case there was any kind of evidence or clues that might help lead them to Kaylee. Officers went to the farm to investigate further and they soon found a number of items of clothing that looked like they had blood stains on them. And when they compared those clothes to the CCTV footage they gained from the co-op shop, they saw that Stephen was wearing clothes that looked exactly the same. They would need to complete DNA tests to confirm, 
but it was highly unlikely that these blood-stained clothes would belong to anyone other than Stephen. From there, things progressed at a rapid pace. A statement was released that the police were no longer investigating this as a disappearance, but now as a murder. She was dropped off on Central Avenue in Ipstock on Friday evening by her parents, and we've still not seen her since. This is an extremely traumatic time for her parents, who are deeply worried, as Kaylee has not made contact and she has not returned home. As inquiries have been completed, we have become increasingly concerned that she may have come to harm. And today, we have told the family that we are treating her disappearance as a murder inquiry. We have found what we believe to be Kaylee's phone in Ipstock, and we have found items of clothing that we believe to be Kaylee's in the Ibstock and Dysworth areas of Leicestershire. We have two males, aged 27 and 28, in police custody, who have been arrested on suspicion of murder. We need to find Kaylee. It wasn't long after that that Stephen asked to speak to his appropriate adult. I couldn't find much information about why he needed an appropriate adult specifically, but It does seem as though he did need someone in this role, legally. It was during this conversation that Stephen admitted that he did know where Kaylee was, in an open area of Sense Park, less than half a mile from the centre of Ibstock town. Stephen had used the word hidden, and because of the time that had passed, it was clear that Kaylee was probably dead. Kaylee's older brother Kyle was spoken to by reporters during the search. No, I feel hopeless. Do you allow yourself to think that she might not be alive? A bit. A bit. It must be really difficult when the the police start using words like like murder. Yeah, it is. It is. But I've got to keep strong for me, mum and my dad. And the rest. Officers worked quickly, searching the large expanse of woodland over the next few hours. It turned dark quickly, and by nightfall, it was proving almost impossible to search. They had been given instructions from Stephen, but even with those, they hadn't been able to find Kaylee. There was talk of the search being called off until the morning because of the almost impossibility of finding Kaylee until there was at least some light. But, Four of the remaining investigating team refused to leave and continued searching with four torches and little else. By 10pm, they'd been searching for hours and were beginning to lose hope of finding Kaylee that night, when one officer's torch flashed over a slightly raised area of embankment and on top of it lay the body of Kaylee Haywood. The officer shouted for the rest of the team to come over and it was there that they discovered the extent of Kaylee's condition. She was found dead. She was lying on her back and side almost completely naked and propped in a twisted position. The wounds to her face and head were clear and horrific and there were what looked like ligature marks around her wrists. Stephen Biedman was charged with rape and murder and Luke Harlow was charged with two counts of sexual activity with a minor and grooming. Um, By this point, she's pretty much walking because I shout I must have stared off I must have mm. so is she resisting you at this point or is she just walking no not when she's walking no okay are you having to control her by hold her or is she walking independently by this point she is walking independently but up until that point no and how are you managing to control her just pulling her pulling her by her hand yeah Alright, okay. Are you using anything else? Is no. it just your presence? Is there any weapons? No weapons, nothing. Okay. Okay. Right, so by this point she's scared, you're in sense by Yeah. And she's walking. Right. Go on. No you keep saying that. Look, if you've done nothing and she's run out of flat 
You don't run out of her house just because someone's kissing you. You're not doing anything, so what's happening? Ha I honestly can't remember. I've been drinking. We'd all been drinking. See, the issue is, she's run out, possibly, with her phone, without her trousers, and there's a complete as you've described, disarray in the flat, the speakers are over. So there's obviously been a struggle. Well, that's the implication, but I, we're asking you if you can you can explain what's happened. I honestly cannot explain that. Because whatever's happened there has triggered everything. It is, that is the, trigger, that, that is the yeah, trigger point absolutely. of everything that's happened. Mm -hmm. Both Stephen Biedman and Luke Harlow pleaded guilty to these charges, but... After consulting with Stephanie and Martin, the prosecution also decided to press charges of false imprisonment on both men. Stephen and Luke both pleaded not guilty, with Stephen claiming that Kaylee was free to leave at any point. Obviously, this was an unbelievable version of what actually happened, and so a trial was set for those charges to go forward. Not only was the state of Luke's house an indication that Kaylee had been held against her will, but his glasses were broken and Stephen's injuries were also a clear indication of a struggle, or a number of struggles with Kaylee, both inside and outside of the house. The real version, as determined by the prosecution, was presented during the trial for the false imprisonment charges. They presented the case that Luke invited Stephen over to show off the fact that he'd got Kaylee into his house and was drinking with her. Kaylee had then refused Stephen's advances, and this is when the neighbours heard that crashing and banging coming from the house. After that, the pair decided to keep Kaylee in Luke's house by restraining her. They also raped her. At one point, as soon as she was able to, she managed to escape her restraints and actually got out of the house. This was just a few moments before that neighbour looked out of his window and saw what he thought was a police officer restraining someone. What actually happened was that as soon as Kaylee escaped the house, she ran as fast as she could out of the house across the road and out of the estate towards Sense Valley Park. Unfortunately, Stephen had also run out of the house and was chasing her down the street. At this point, Kaylee was half naked. She had nothing on her lower half, including having no shoes on, and she was running for her life. She was screaming for help, but no one came to her aid. Stephen managed to catch up to her and tackled her down to the floor, which is when she dropped her phone. After he'd gotten control of her, he picked her up and forced her to walk to the car park of Sense Valley Park. He raped her. Then he took her in a different direction and walked her across a road and past that point where her bra was found a short time later. The pair continued walking for around a mile into a wooded section of the park until Kaylee actually managed to escape again. It was only a few moments before Stephen managed to catch up to her and again pulled Kaylee to the ground. She managed to get hold of a brick from nearby and actually began hitting Stephen. That's how he got those wounds on the front of his face. Unfortunately, he managed to wrestle the brick off of her and hit her on the head. He said that is how he killed her. Evidence showed that Kaylee had tried to fight for her life. Her injuries were extensive, including a broken nose, a broken jaw, defence wounds to her hands and arms, and wounds to the front and back of her head. The post-mortem examination identified extensive blunt force injuries to her neck and head, as well as underlying fracturing of facial bones. Kaylee's head and face were beaten so badly that officers decided Stephanie and Martin shouldn't see her, and when they went to say goodbye, they were faced with Kaylee lying under a sheet, covered from head to toe. Martin and Stephanie's goodbye was tainted, and they had to say goodbye simply by holding their dead daughter's hand. Two witnesses who live in the same house together, nearby to Sense Valley Park, told the court that they heard a loud scream in the early hours of the 16th of November. One said, quote, I was lying there. I can't be 100% sure how long I lay there, and then, all of a sudden, I heard a loud scream. Someone screaming, Mummy. It sounded like a female to me, and if I'm honest, whoever it was sounded frightened. The other witness said, quote, It sounded like a young child. 
Sam opened the window and shouted, but nobody replied. That same witness added that the scream of mummy sounded so close she thought someone was in her garden. Both men were found guilty of the false imprisonment charge. Stephen was given 35 years for rape, murder and false imprisonment. Luke was given 12 years for sexual grooming, sexual activity with a child and false imprisonment. Luke was later charged with two different counts of grooming two different girls throughout 2014 and 2015, one aged 13 and one aged 15. It's not clear what his intention was in both of those cases, but the prosecution presented evidence that both these girls believed Luke was their boyfriend. They also showed a series of social media messages sent by Luke to the 15-year-old girl. One said, quote, I wish I could kidnap you for Christmas, but I would probably be arrested and sent to prison. Another said, quote, If I kidnap you, I am keeping you. More messages were presented showing that Luke had an interest in having sex with drunk, unconscious girls and wanted to keep a girl as a slave. On the 4th of January 2016, a film called Kaylee's Love Story was released. The five-minute film from Leicestershire Police formed the centrepiece of a campaign launched against child abuse and and sexual exploitation. The film's reconstructions show the final few days of Kaylee's life and the abuse she suffered. It went on to be seen by 55,000 schoolchildren over the following year and saw an increase in reportings by schoolchildren of abuse and grooming as a result. Stephanie and Martin chose to have white horses carry Kaylee's coffin in a purple-lined carriage to her final resting place. Because Kaylee's favourite colour was purple, the streets were lined with purple ribbons and the community of Ibstock and the surrounding areas came out in their hundreds to show support for the Haywood family and the community grieved for the loss of this vibrant, caring 15-year-old girl. <laughs> 